In 2054, Washington, D.C.'s pre-crime police has developed a technology that stops murderers before they act, reducing the murder rate to zero. Murders are predicted using three mutated humans called precogs who pre-visualize crimes by receiving visions of the future while they spend their entire time submerged in water and connected to a machine that records these visions. Would-be murderers are imprisoned in their own happy virtual reality inside special pods. The federal government is considering adopting this controversial program for the whole country. Today's premonition shows a woman having a passionate affair with her side piece until they're found by the husband, who immediately gets furious and kills the guy. Since their faces are pretty clear in the vision, the system can identify them and the machine the precogs are connected to expels a red ball with the names. Chief John is called to look at the case, which will happen in 24 minutes. They have a name but not the location, so John uses a special touch screen to look at every little detail of the vision to get any clues. Meanwhile the future murderer is leaving his house for work, and the fact the guy is moving makes it hard for John to pinpoint his location. He analyzes all of the predictive data at hand, trying to find evidence of an address, when he's suddenly interrupted by Whitwer, an agent from the Department of Justice that has some questions. John ignores him because he wants to concentrate on the case, so another employee explains to Whitwer how things work. With 10 minutes to go, John looks carefully at one of the images and recognizes the park, so he and his team get armed and get on the special transport platforms, which puts them on futuristic bikes that will get them to the location in seconds. Back to the future murderer, he returns to his house because he forgot his glasses and finds his wife having an affair. Grabbing a pair of scissors, he hides in the room to wait for the right moment to strike. Outside, the team arrives and discovers all the houses here look the same. John uses his observation skills and notices one door is open, so he asks someone at the base if a door was left open in the vision too. He gets an affirmative answer, and with only 30 seconds to go, he runs into the bedroom just as the man is about to stab his wife, jumping on him to hold him back as the rest of the team comes in through the windows. John uses a scanner to check the man's eyes and once his identity is confirmed, they arrest him for future murder. In the base, the precogs are still processing the event. Whitwer asks why they are acting as though the murder is still happening and learns that it's just precog deja vu. This happens with the real bad visions that can return like echoes. In the evening, John goes for a run through the city and notices all the giant screens showing Burgess, the director of pre-crime, promoting his system and the fact there have been no murders since pre-crime began. When he reaches a dark alley, John buys an upper known as New Clarity, and gets worried when the seller calls him chief. However the man takes off his glasses and reveals he's missing his eyes, explaining why he isn't on the system. Then John returns to his apartment, which has been a huge mess since his son disappeared and his wife left him. After swallowing the new clarity, he plays some old 3D videos of his son Sean and his wife Lara, talking to them as if they were really there. He's watched these so many times that he already knows what they'll say. The next day, John runs into Burgess, who tells him that the company's future is in jeopardy and that the government is keeping tabs on them. He asks John to keep an eye on Whitwer because he may be here to boycott them. In the office, Whitwer continues to question this new technology and is rather skeptical because they're technically arresting individuals who have broken no law, and stopping the future creates a paradox. The agents defend the operation, saying because they use metaphysics the precogs are never wrong. The precogs don't see what you intend to do, only what you will do. Whitwer still wants to talk to the precogs, and when John says he can't, Whitwer reveals he has a warrant. John has no choice but to take Whitwer to the pool where they meet Wally, the guy in charge of taking care of the precogs. Wally tells them that they cannot touch them and explains they're a pair of twin boys plus a girl named Agatha. Their minds are connected to a screen on the ceiling. Suddenly Whitwer prods John for personal information, like poking him about his missing child. Growing annoyed, John demands to know Whitwer's intentions, but Whitwer just says a system controlled by human minds can't be perfect. After everyone leaves, John sees Agatha wake up and waves to her, trying to get her attention. At first she doesn't react, but suddenly she grabs him and pulls him towards her as she asks can you see. At that moment another premonition appears on the screen showing a man drowning a woman in a lake. Agatha drifts back into the water as Wally rushes back into the room, not believing John when he tells him that Agatha grabbed him because precogs aren't supposed to be aware of humans. Afterward John goes to talk with Gideon, the sentry in charge of the prisoner who plays the organ to relax them. John describes the vision Agatha showed him, and by looking at some of the records, Gideon finds one of the first cases that the pre-crime division ever investigated. Then Gideon brings out the prisoners, who are locked into pods that float around the room and are unconscious. They come to the murderer in the drowning incident, and Gideon reports that he almost killed a woman named M. Lively in a lake but they never managed to discover his identity. When John asks why, Gideon tells him that the murderer swapped out his eyes in order to fool the scanners. They try to look at Agatha's original premonition, but no data comes up, which is shocking. Next they try to find more about Anne, but there's no data about her either. John takes the data chip about M. Lively from the machine, even though Gideon warns him it's illegal. Afterward, John brings the data to Burgess and tells him about all the missing information. However Burgess dodges the subject and informs John that Lara has called him because she's worried about John's addiction, but John insists that he's fine. 
Meanwhile Whitwer looks around John's messy apartment, where he finds the illegal uppers in the videos, thinking John is losing his mind. At the base, Agatha emerges from the water in the tank with a new premonition and a ball falls out of the machine with the name Leo Crow. John and his assistant begin the process of locating the murder site, following clues like an older woman smoking a pipe, two figures in a room, and a man wearing sunglasses outside the window. All of a sudden, another projection appears showing John killing Leo Crow. John is shocked but doesn't tell his assistant what he saw. When a brown ball that bears the name of the murderer comes out of the machine, he grabs it before the other man sees it. After sending his assistant out for a snack, John looks at the ball and confirms it has his name. He drops the ball and watches the premonition from different angles, not believing he could do that, but the result is always the same. Wally notices all this and says he will give him two minutes before he hits the alarm, so John walks briskly out of the pre-crime division and gets in an elevator. Just as the doors are closing, Whitworth gets on and confronts John about the substances he found. Thinking Whitworth set him up, John pins him up against the wall and puts a gun to his head as Whitworth says he'll lose his badge for possession. At that moment the alarm goes off, thus John gets off the elevator and runs. As John drives away from headquarters, he calls Burgess, screaming that Whitworth set him up. Burgess offers for John to hide at his house, but John has other ideas. He breaks out of his vehicle to jump onto another one because he's on a vertical futuristic highway. By jumping from vehicle to vehicle, John gets away through the road and eventually jumps through a window, landing in a room with a yoga class. Meanwhile Whitworth visits Burgess to ask him about his meetings with John, but Burgess doesn't give him any information, causing Whitworth to threaten to call the Attorney General before leaving. Back to John, he makes it to the subway station, where digital advertisements talk to him using his name because all surveillance cameras scan people's eyes for the system. John gets on the train and a camera above them identifies him, immediately alerting the pre-crime office. On the train, a man reads a newspaper article about John and looks over at him suspiciously. Noticing this, John gets off at the next station, only to find the cops waiting for him. John begins running away, managing to reach the streets rather quickly, but when he reaches an alley the cops use their jetpacks to surround him. The agents try to make him see reason because he's their friend, but John won't cooperate and when they push him up against a window, a barking dog pops up startling everyone. John takes advantage of this to fend them off and hit them with their own weapons before climbing on a fire escape to get away. As he quickly goes up, the cops use their jetpacks to try to catch him, so John kicks and punches them down, he also presses the button in one of the jetpacks to send a cop flying away. Another agent manages to grab him by the leg and the stairs start bending, so John jumps and lands on top of another agent that he uses as his personal jet. John pilots the man around to escape from the incoming agents then enters a large construction tube that the jetpack burns as they fly through it. As the structure falls on top of the men below, John and the cop break through a window and begin flying around various apartments until they finally land on a poor boy's bed. After pushing the agent away, John leaves the building only to run into Whitworth, who chases John on foot with his own team. They enter a factory where John pushes barrels against the agents to make them trip and steals their weapons, which he uses against them. Then John tries to escape by jumping on a machine, but Whitworth follows him and the two men get into a fistfight. They exchange quite a few hits before they fall off the machine, landing in a car that is currently being built. Whitworth gets off as soon as he notices, but John gets trapped inside. However this turns out to be good because once the car is finished, John simply drives away to escape. A few hours later, John arrives at a house in the middle of nowhere, where the vines on the wall try to catch him. Fortunately he easily pushes them away and gets inside to find Iris, the creator of the precogs who immediately forces him to drink a medicinal tea because the vines may have poisoned him. Inside the room there are lots of plants that try to grab John too, so he does his best to dodge them as he asks if it's possible to fake a vision, insisting that he isn't a killer. Iris reveals that the precogs sometimes disagree, but the data for ambiguous cases is destroyed by the organization to cover up any hint of fallibility. These ambiguous cases are known as minority reports and Burgess knows about them. This makes John furious because it means he has been locking up potentially innocent people. Iris advises him to trust nobody and to seek out the minority report, kissing him as she explains that the data may be deleted but Agatha, who is the most powerful precog, always contains the minority report in her mind. At pre-crime, Whitwer and the agents manage to identify the location of the incoming murder, but it seems it'll only happen in 22 hours. He also finds a picture of Lara at John's desk, giving him an idea. A few hours later, Whitwer visits Lara at her lake house, but she swears she hasn't heard from John. When Whitwer begins wondering about John's sanity, Lara explains she didn't leave him because he's an addict, she left him because he reminded him too much of their son. Back to John, he goes to see Eddie, a sketchy doctor that can get his eyes replaced so that he won't be identifiable in the system. As Eddie injects him with anesthesia, John requests to keep his old eyes in a bag for later. During the procedure, John doesn't feel any pain but he's still awake to see how creepy it is. Once the procedure is over, John's eyes are bandaged and he mustn't take it off for 12 hours or he will go blind. Eddie shows him a series of ropes connected to the wall that lead to the bathroom and the kitchen. Before going away, 
He leaves an injection pen, a baggie with John's old eyes, and a timer that will go off when the 12 hours are over. John takes his favorite substance and goes to sleep, which makes him dream of his son's disappearance. That day they had been at the public pool, and Sean asked John to try to beat the time a whale can be underwater. John submerged himself and suddenly saw Sean's watch fall into the water, but when he came back up, Sean had disappeared. John wakes up screaming Sean's name, haunted by the past. He gets up and goes to the refrigerator, where he accidentally picks up a moldy sandwich and sour milk that he quickly spits out. On the television behind him, the show Cops is on showing a live broadcast of the agents coming to arrest John. The investigation team arrives at the apartment building where John is staying and begins a scan to find him. They release a number of technological spiders that scurry into the apartment building, entering every room to scan the eyes of all the dwellers. John hears the noises so he immediately grabs his things and hides in a tub filled with cold water, which should hide his body heat from the scan. The spiders enter the bathroom and can't find him so they almost give up, but at that moment John accidentally lets out an air bubble, and the noise alerts the spiders of his presence. As the cops make their way upstairs, the spiders wait patiently by the tub until John can't take it anymore and comes up for air. While using their little legs to tase him, the spiders raise the bandage and scan his eyes, making him wiggle in pain. Luckily John's new eyes trick the scan and the agents leave thinking he isn't there. The next day, Whitwer looks more closely at the Leo Crow premonition and realizes there's another person in the room that they didn't notice before. When they zoom in, they notice it's Agatha, meaning John may be coming to the base soon. Meanwhile John is outside, injecting himself with the pen Eddie gave him, which completely transforms his face. Then he enters the building through a back door only agents know of, and when he finds a scan at the door, he takes out the bag with his old eyes. Unfortunately they're slippery because of the blood and they fall to then roll down the corridor. John quickly chases them, catching one just before it falls through a grate like the other one. Afterward John enters the precog lab and after closing the door, he convinces Wally to help him. They begin looking into Agatha's memories while she reaches out for John, again asking can you see? At that moment Whitwer arrives with the agents, so John grabs Agatha and pulls a lever that sucks them both through the floor of the pool. Wally tells Whitwer that the remaining precogs cannot predict murders if Agatha isn't there because they're a hive mind, so anything can happen from now on without them knowing. There's less than an hour for the murder to happen and John is escaping in the car with Agatha, while his face slowly returns to normal. John asks Agatha to give him the information he needs, but she's too shocked to speak because this is the first time she's living in the present and she's tired of the future. To avoid getting unwanted attention, John stops by a store to get her some nice clothes. At pre-crime, Whitwer has deduced that John is not interested in ransoming Agatha, but instead wants some information that's inside her. Looking for clues, Whitwer pulls apart John's computer and finds the card of a computer technician known as Rufus. This Rufus is doing his job at his virtual reality organization when he's suddenly visited by John and Agatha. When John asks Rufus to hack into Agatha's mind, Rufus refuses, and John has to violently threaten him into accepting. Rufus connects Agatha to his own computer and they download the vision of John's crime, which plays exactly as last time, showing John killing Leo Crow. A furious John yells at Agatha, demanding his minority report, but Agatha says he doesn't have one. Suddenly, Agatha asks can you see and her body begins shaking as she has another premonition. John looks up at the wall and sees Anne Lively being drowned by a masked man. John realizes Agatha wants him to solve Anne's death, but at that moment Agatha senses the police have arrived. As the agents raid Rufus' business, John and Agatha make a run for it through a mall. As they move Agatha sees the future and tells John every single thing he must do, he must grab an umbrella, then dodge the man that drops the suitcase and the woman that knows his face. She stops him in the lobby to stand behind a man selling balloons, hiding them from the cops that now split up to go look in other places. Then the duo leaves the mall, and two cops finally see them. Outside, Agatha tells John to give a beggar some money, and when the beggar leans over to get the coins, the cops trip over him. Since it's raining, John puts up the umbrella, allowing them to hide from the cops again. Moments later they make it to the building from the vision, and John notices that a billboard is being raised up with a picture of the man that matches one of the faces from the prediction. Inside, John finds the older woman with the pipe, also matching the vision. With 12 minutes left, John threatens the receptionist with his gun until he reveals Leo Crow is in room 1006. The duo immediately enters the room, only to find it empty. Remembering the details of the vision, John realizes this is actually 1009 with a number turned around. Next they go to the actual 1006 and find the door open. On the bed there are lots of photographs of children, and John is devastated to see Sean is there too. John finally understands he doesn't have an alternative future, Leo Crow is the only man in the world he actually wants to kill. At that moment Leo Crow enters the room, causing Agatha to scream as she lives through the present of her vision. John jumps on Leo and begins throwing him around, breaking a mirror and hitting him until Leo admits Sean is dead. After beating Leo up thoroughly, John takes out his gun at the same time the sign goes up outside, matching the vision perfectly. However, Agatha weeps and reminds John that he still can make a choice. 
John hesitates for several seconds and as the time of the crime passes, in the end he decides to arrest Leo instead of shooting him. Shockingly Leo isn't happy with this and reveals that if John doesn't kill him, his family won't get a reward. Leo reveals that he was hired to pretend to be the man who killed Sean, that same person provided the fake pictures. John wants to know who hired him, but Leo cannot tell him or his family gets nothing. Then Leo grabs the gun and ends things for himself, falling out the window. Shortly after John and Agatha flee, Whitwer and the cops arrive to investigate the crime scene. Whitwer is skeptical that a child killer would put all his photographs on his bed and realizes this is all a setup. Afterward Whitwer meets with Burgess, presenting John's gun to him as he explains that they discovered Agatha's stream of and Lively's murder is missing. Then he shows the recording he got from Rufus, which appears to be the same, but actually the wind is moving the water in opposite directions. This is a different murder, and someone deleted it under the excuse it was a precog deja vu because of the similarities. If a killer is arrested before they can commit a murder, another killer can come and complete the crime dressed in the same clothes and using the same method. Suddenly, Burgess shoots Whitwer twice, knowing the precogs can't tell he did this because Agatha is missing. Sometime later, John and Agatha go to hide at Lara's house. Lara sees them from afar and calls Burgess to ask for his help, so Burgess tells her to keep them busy while he makes his way there. While Agatha enjoys Sean's old room, John and Lara go for a walk and John tells her everything that happened. Putting the information together makes him realize he was set up for Leo Crow's murder because he must know something about the Anne Lively case. John and Agatha run inside to find Agatha having all kinds of visions about the future Sean couldn't have, saying he would have become a vet. Agatha then reveals that Anne Lively was her mother and that she was killed trying to reconnect with Agatha after the precogs were taken by the company. When John asks who killed Anne, Agatha suddenly screams because the agents are coming. John tries to run away, but soon the cops enter the room and arrest him, putting him to sleep with a special headband. A few hours later, Agatha is returned to the precog pool by Wally while Gideon takes pleasure in loading John into a prisoner pod. Meanwhile Lara visits Burgess, who is using the story of Leo being Sean's killer. Lara asks him about Anne Lively because John mentioned her, but Burgess pretends he doesn't know anything about a drowned Anne. After Burgess leaves for his special event, Anne realizes she never mentioned that Anne drowned, meaning Burgess is the mastermind behind this. She takes John's gun and goes to see Gideon, threatening him into releasing her husband and presenting John's eye to show how she got inside. Meanwhile Burgess speaks at a special dinner in his honor, where he's gifted a gold revolver to congratulate him for ending violence in the city. After his speech is over, Burgess receives a call from John, who reveals he knows Burgess killed Anne. At the same time, Lara calls John's assistant and asks him to go to Agatha to retrieve a memory. At that moment, Agatha's vision begins playing on all pre-crime computers and the screens of the party. Burgess had called Anne to meet her at the lake, promising to let her see her daughter. He also hired the random dude that tried to kill her, but after he was arrested, Burgess came in and finished the crime, making it look like deja vu. While everyone at the party is in shock, Burgess sneaks out of the room and notices John escaping through the kitchen. While Burgess gets his revolver ready, Agatha predicts the murder of John by Burgess. John rants angrily about how Burgess dared to use his son's death against him, and both men run upstairs until they're alone on the rooftop patio. When Burgess takes out his weapon, John points out Agatha must have already seen this, so Burgess has two options. If he kills John, he will be arrested, and if he doesn't, his company is over because it will be revealed not to work. As Burgess draws his revolver, John implores him to take control of his own destiny, and after lots of hesitation, Burgess ends things for himself before the cops arrive. After this incident, pre-crime is disbanded and all prisoners are released. John and Lara get back together and are expecting a new baby. Agatha and the boys are transferred to a cozy cabin in the middle of nowhere, this way there aren't any people around that will trigger their abilities and they can live in peace. Make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you can watch more videos like this. Thanks for watching.